Thank you, Carol, Christy. I just, I'm grateful that you even invited me. Um, I am so grateful to be in person with all of you. It's just a breath of fresh air to have live faces finally. And so I'm, it's an honor to be here again. So when Carol had asked me to come here to share my switch point with you, I hyperventilated a little bit because I thought um, I, did I only have one? Was I supposed to have one pivotal moment in my life that got me to the rosy I am today? And we're all here because really switch point believes in meeting people exactly where they're at. And, and that's really what switch points about. And that's the beauty of it. And I'm here to share my switch point, except I had so many layers of it, I needed multiple switch points. And, and that's where I am going to share that with you. So I am the baby of five kids. Um, every one of us have different fathers. We have one mother who was um, alcohol and drug addicted. She was mentally ill, but it wasn't diagnosed at that time. Um, she self-medicated all the time. She had tons of pills in the morning, lots in the, in the, during the day, tons in the afternoon, in the evening. She had chasers of bottles of vodka, every bottle of liquor. And after she had them, she would beat us. There were five kids and, um, there were a period of time when she would, um, get us in a home. So she would go to welfare, get a stipend check, get us set up with heat, electricity, and a home with the first month and last month and deposit so we can get there. And then she would leave us there. She would leave us sometimes for a day, sometimes a couple days, sometimes weeks or months at a time. There's five kids literally there to fend for ourselves. And there were two, um, 10 years between the oldest sister and myself. And so you think of five kids on your own, having to fend for yourself. Sometimes we were in apartments, sometimes we were in motels. Um, sometimes we lived in our cars, um, in a cardboard box, behind grocery stores, homeless shelters, um, rundown motels, um, evicted places, condemned buildings, the projects of New York. Um, Sometimes she would abandon us at people's houses and they'd send us to foster homes. Altogether, all five of us were in 52 foster homes. Um, I was on 11 before the age of 10. And some of them were very abusive. Some were really kind, really kind. But while we were together, think of five kids all by themselves. So we obviously wanted to, we needed food. And think of, we had to raise ourselves. We needed food. So we would be creative with how to get food. So my older sisters, at first it was kind of a, a creative, like how should we get food? We couldn't go to a food bank because kids can't go to food banks. You need an adult. Um, that's actually what had gotten me so connected with Christy because what she did as a, as a child advocate at the schools. See, just thinking about it, just, ugh the backpack program and sending kids home with school from school with, with food is priceless for a child on the fringe of society. They just don't have that. I've never had that as a kid in New York. It's just unheard of. So we would have to be really creative. We would go into grocery stores and sometimes my older sisters, we would say, Oh, we need to go and ask for box boys. And, say, well, our parents are moving. So we would get, my older sisters would go get boxes and they would be the clamshell ones. So they would fit on top of each other. My older sister would go and slide food in between the boxes. So they just slide through. I would be the distraction. So at a certain age, once I understood how to play the part, I would start throwing stuff off the shelf, start screaming. My older brother, who is two years older than me, would Rosie, no, no, no. And, but it was good because my other sisters could like grab, put food in their clothes. And of course, depending on the season, 
Summer was a little more difficult to stuff food in the pant belt pockets, so I had to be very thoughtful about what we were getting, what time of year. Winter was a lot more, um, was much easier because you had a lot of bulky clothes, so we could be, um, get peanut butter, um, Jiffy muffin mix, things like that. But again, you have to be thoughtful about what you can cook as a homeless kid. You don't have baking stuff and all of those things. So our shopping place would be um, Salvation Army dumpster diving. That's where we would go shopping for our clothes, for household utilities, anything that we needed for electric wise. We would just do dumpster diving at any kind of thrift store. You know where they drop off the donation dumpsters. That's where we go shopping. That's where we got our school clothes. Um, when we wanted to have fun, we we would go to parks. Again, five kids. We want to play. We want to play with kids. But one look, some parents look at us kids again. On the French society, it's clear we don't have parents. Matted hair, our clothes. We don't have clean clothes. We're, we're not going to wash them. We're kids. Maybe every few months we'll wash them in the bathtub. We're not going to do that. So we look the part of homeless kids. So no one really wants their children to play with us. And it was, it was really hard because we're one of those kids. And um, what we found out, though, on a beach, that's where you can assimilate with all the other kids and you could play just like all the other ones. So we took off our clothes, we washed up, got our hair wet, and then we started playing with all the other kids. Also, in New York, the other great thing about the beaches, there were mussels. There were mussels all around, so you could pick all the mussels and clams, and my sisters would also get onion grass and make another meal out of it. So it was amazing. So those were other resources, again, kids on the fringe of society would get and be resourceful the food. Um, bakeries. When there are bakery drop-offs first thing in the morning outside grocery stores, bakeries do a little shopping, drop-off. All those places with donuts and bagels, we would take those too. Those would be our food. Um, farmers markets all on Long Island. We had lots of farmers markets, farms. We would go scavenge people's gardens or farmers markets until we actually had a dog out there and my brother and I would go and chase the dog because we accidentally let it go and kind of like poked it with a stick and made him run and so, so until the farmer came out with a shotgun and we had to change our ammo and realized okay we can't do that anymore but it was you have to be creative again we were starving we were food we were malnutritioned but um, we had to be, we needed food. The one thing that was awesome, we have to think of what does school provide? No matter what, no matter where you are as a kid, no matter where you move, you have to go to school. Now, our, my mom would leave us for weeks or months at a time, no matter where we were. However, when she would get um, the police after her because she had warrants for arrest all the time. She would drunk driving so the police would come after her. She would pull us out of school. We'd go to the next place. Except when we were in school, think of what it provides for a child in need. Temperature controlled environment, clean running water, free lunch. One look at us, we've got a free lunch. Not to mention encouragement and self-worth and a much needed education. So those are things that we, and six hours a day, we had something to do. Friends, peers, all of those things, not to mention an awesome library. That's actually where I learned, had my hunger for knowledge. I started feeding that. I became a sponge for books and just trying to fathom a life beyond poverty, beyond homelessness, and trying to figure out what a life beyond out of our current circumstances could look like. It was, it was really, really difficult to try to see anything out of our circumstances because as awesome as it was to be a kid in school, we knew that it was just short-lived. My mother was always taking us out of our school, out of a situation that we loved. 
we loved because again those adults were kind those small kind gestures towards child in need we there was one moment in time when there's a child in need before them and they took a moment to give them hope they gave them hope they gave us hope that there was an adult that cared about us it wasn't our mother it was those adults those librarians those teachers that gave us a moment of time lunch from workers would give us extra tater tots extra hot dogs an extra apple to take home with us because it was clear we had no food we were starving it was those small kind gestures that were valuable libraries when we didn't have school public libraries public libraries also temperature controlled environment clean running water it's a safe environment adults that watch it over you bathrooms that work electricity that turns on a lot of those things we just didn't have in our homes that we stayed in it was just we were so fortunate to even be there then libraries I learned how to read in one of those public libraries from my sister my sisters taught me how to read in one of those public libraries while we were homeless that's beautiful that's hopeful so when we were living with our mother as tough as it sounds there were five kids without a parent but again we had a goal we wanted to have fun so we had as much fun as we could when our mother wasn't there because when she was there we knew that our fun time was over when she would come home things would escalate to not only abuse but a level of brutality to where if it would happen now she would be arrested probably for the rest of her life and would be in prison um, it was it was so abusive she was very methodical about where she abused too she was always underneath our clothing our hair she was a hair puller pinch um, it it was it was brutal we had cuts and bruises and kicks I had my my vertebrae cracked from a heel being kicked in while she was mad at me one day and um, irons thrown at me and she was she was she was really mean mom but still we chose to be with her regardless of how abandoned we were because some there was some solace about knowing the devil we knew instead of the devil we didn't know there were some foster homes so all of these times when we were abandoned some places we would sometimes be turned into social services and we would go into foster homes and sometimes those foster homes weren't wonderful sometimes they were great and those were another small kind gestures that kind adults that loved us so much but other ones were not and and bad things happened to us um, and you think of five kids five little kids in one foster home chances of us finding five beds in one home in a foster home slim to none so a lot of times we were separated and we don't want to be separated anymore and so we decided we're going to take the chance we're going to be slide under the radar stay really good we were just not say tell anybody what our situation was not tell any secrets not say anything about the abuse not say anything if someone knocks on the door we're gonna know if it's first thing in the morning we're gonna know okay mom is at the deli she's peeling potatoes if it's during the day if they knock during the day she's selling real estate because at one time she did one time she did work at the deli if it's in the evening okay she's at the bar she's the barmaid because at one time she was and this went on for months she she never came home but to our sisters and I my brother we had a story and we just did not want to be separated anymore years went on like this and literally she would pack us up when she finally came home days and weeks at a time it was it was brutal we would rather have her not there but again as traumatized as it was we would rather her rather have her there stay in her um, I guess custody <sighs> nah. one time it was it was very towards it was towards the very end when we were in when my sister my older sister Regina was 12 years old 
my older sisters were 14 and 15 and they were wanting to leave home. I say that metaphorically because we didn't really have a home. They just wanted to go and do their own thing. There wasn't a parent at home that really cared about them, but they wanted to stay at friends and do their own thing and start growing up. So my 12 year old sister, Regina, had to start being the parent for her two younger sisters. That happened for a few months. And then my mother came home on one of her drunken binges and I was eating cereal and I dropped the cereal bowl and she was passed out on the couch. The cereal bowl dropped on the ground and shattered so many pieces and it woke her up. She grabbed my hair, threw me against the window, shattered. I was bloody. I was a kid. And my sister grabbed her, jumped on her back, and my sister got the beating that was intended for me. And it had gotten so bad. We were so emaciated and just starving. We couldn't cover the bruises anymore. It was all over her face. It was everywhere. And it was then we realized we couldn't hide the bruises. It was hard to hold the pact together because we couldn't, we couldn't not tell the story. Social services came. The teachers were saying, what's happening? What's happening? What's happening? And finally, they said, okay, here, we'll tell the story. My brother and I were in one and my sisters were in the other. And that was the last time I saw them for 20 years. When we were in that foster home, my brother and I were in one foster home and then my sisters went to the other. And in this particular foster home that my brother and I were in, it was, um, it was kind of a mess. We had one room where all the foster kids were and then they had a biological child that had her own room. Um, there was eight of us in one room, bunk beds all lined the sides, one light in the very middle, um, the door locked from the outside, and there was a light switch on the outside of the door. Um, we had a bucket in the closet to use the bathroom in the middle of the night, and we had to empty it out um, in the morning. We had to take turns. Um, it was very abusive. It was the most abusive thing. I thought my mother was abusive. This foster home was horrible. Um, but the funny thing was, we tried to tell my mother about the abusive home and on one of her supervised visits, and she was really mad. She was really mad because she thought, no one can abuse her kids but her. <laughs> it's like, what is this? So, she's, so she tried telling social services what's going on, what kind of credibility will she have? She's an abuser herself. So they said, you know, something's got to happen. We've got to take the kids. You've got to move them. And they're like, we're not, and we're not listening to you. That's the reason why your kids are in foster care in the first place. So eventually, um, it was her first visitation, at-home visitation, without supervision. December 21st, 1980. And um, she kidnapped us. She kidnapped us out of the foster home. We were on the run for two years. Um, she was drunk driving, hit a child on Mastic Highway on New Long Island, and hurt the kid pretty bad. They got the license plate number and were tracking her down. They were very close to catching her, and she realized she had to flee the state. So she did what she usually did, and she found an awesome guy in a bar with her welfare check in hand, and uh, convinced the guy to drive cross country with her. So um, sure enough, we ended, we lasted three days on the road with this guy named Mick. Um, didn't talk very much at all, but long enough to spend a great quality time with him. <laughs> but by the time we actually got to Idaho, Caldwell, Idaho, um, I think he was done with my mother because as soon as we got to my, friend, or my mother's friend's house, he took off. He was gone. He left all of our stuff on the side of the road. We grabbed our plastic bags of stuff and 
so we were in Idaho. We were stuck in Caldwell, Idaho, and um, and that brings us to um, we. It was the best moment of my life because I went back to school. I enrolled in my I was in fifth grade, and I got connected with a librarian. I was a librarian helper. The limit was three books, but because I was helping, I got five books to take home. And it was awesome because I loved reading. It was just the most amazing. And the librarian would always tell me how smart I was. Nobody told me how smart I was. Nobody. Again, those small, kind gestures, the small, kind things to say to me. I've never heard people say nice things to me. No one. My mother always beat me, told me how stupid and horrible, horrible things. It'd say terrible things. So it was, it was, it was awesome. Fifth grade class, they would give me all of these um, little, little tags to say they needed to give a compliment every day. And those were little tags I'll remember forever. Even right before I left, I still had those little tags for a long time about little compliments and stuff. It was just amazing. But my mother was after same tricks, started drinking drugs again, and started stealing from the friend. When her friend realized what was happening, she kicked us out. When we got kicked out, we moved to a trailer park. Now, trailer park might sound a little depressing, but for a kid, it was awesome. Again, I say awesome because as a kid, it's all relative, right? But Trailer parks, they were close together, and there was a lot of kids, a lot of adults, a lot of adults looking out for one another and looking out for the kids. So when my mother would go out for the same thing, go out for weeks and a month at a time, it was my brother and I in a trailer park, lots of neighbors looking out for us, feeding us, and watching, but the nice thing about trailer parks is everyone's really close together. The bad thing is about trailer parks is everyone's really close together. Walls are thin, you hear everything that goes on, you hear glasses break, you hear kids screaming, you hear kids crying, you hear mommy, please don't hurt me anymore. You hear things being thrown, you see glasses break, you see things being thrown out the window, you see kids coming, screaming out the door, please stop hurting me. They run to the neighbors, please save me, my mom's gonna kill me. That's what we were doing. We were running to our neighbors, please save us from our mother. That's what we were doing. And our neighbors heard it. They would come to our door saying, hey, do you need help? My mother would get mad. Leave us alone, mind your own business. That was just her thing. And then she would leave again, weeks or months at a time. That was very short-lived because, again, she found another man, and we left very, very quickly in the middle of the night to a small town in northern Idaho where it was she made her final destination to the man of, that she was going to spend the rest of her life with. Um, the small town was called Cambridge, Idaho population 360 people now this might sound sounds refreshing because you think a lot of space it was a farming community but totally different than the trailer park because you can't hear the kids screaming there's acres and acres between homes it's really hard to hear all of the trauma and the issues with kids with acres and acres in between. This gentleman that she happened to find was the town pedophile. He was well known and she ended up by marrying him. He had 80 acres, had cows, um, chickens, pigs, um, an amazing like 80 acres full of hay, grain. So an actual, I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with the dairy farm. It's a lot of work. A little lot of work. When cows need fed, you have to feed them. So there's no days off unless you don't want to feed animals. But they kind of need to eat every day. So you don't have any days off. 
And during hay season, you cut the hay and bale until 3 o'clock in the morning till the dew sets right before. So it's just part of the deal. And I was, dark, I was a farmhand at 11 years old. My brother was 14, and my stepdad said that I had a, a much better work ethic and I was much stronger, and he was very complimentary and very kind um, at first. The first few months, he was very nice um, and would always give my brother more breaks because he said I was a much harder worker. Um, very, very kind to me. Then he started molesting me, and that lasted seven years. Um, except the farm taught me what true hard work was, true work ethic, tenacity, grit, perseverance. It really taught me what hard work was all about, getting up when you really don't want to, and you do it anyway, every day. You just do it anyway because you have to. Someone's depending on you because you have to. This also taught me what true loneliness and misery and what that really means. This is also where, again, what, a, what school provides. School, again, I loved school. Those teachers, the librarians, lunchroom workers, um, the school secretary, I struggled with school. I did because I hated my home and life. My home life was horrible. My mother still beat me, and now I was the only child at home. My brother was not beat at all. He was. He was the prince of the family, which I love him dearly, but he wasn't beat at all. It was the girls, and it was, it was clear that there was some, it was a relationship issue with my mother, but my brother never got beat. And so I got the brunt of it, 100% of it. So I was molested by my, my stepdad, beat by my mother the whole time. And, um, and it, was, it was really hard, so my only escape was school. But, but I loved it because in a small school, I was able to do so many different things. Um, I did find out I was able to do a lot of sports, which I found out I was not gifted, and that's okay. Um, but I did love yearbook and band, played practically every instrument, which I was not good a lot. Um, and, but I will tell you, I love cheerleading, and that was my favorite. I, I cheered for probably eight years because it was so much fun. Summer activities, I did cheer camps because I loved encouraging people regardless, no matter what they were doing, go for the gold, you can do it, you know, because I loved how it felt to be encouraged. I didn't have that, but when I did, man, I loved it. Man, I loved it. It was getting those small kind gestures. Those people that gave a moment, just one moment in time. When a child in need is before you, you have one fraction of a moment to give them self-worth. And I got it. So as a cheerleader, I'm like, yeah, go team win, yeah, go fight win. It was great. I loved it. So I rarely miss school. But even at its darkness, at its darkest, um, I, I struggled to stay afloat. All of those things were my life preservers. And, but it was hard to stay, stay floating with all the darkness at home. Teachers told me I was smart continually. Librarians encouraged me to go to college. Lunchroom workers would continually give me free food, even though they knew that nothing, no amount of food could repair all the hurt because they knew, they saw the bruises, and I would always laugh it off, like, because I'm on a farm. Um, so that was, that was um, really difficult, especially when I started trying to reach out for help. I was trying to be vulnerable and ask for help, trying to tell people what was happening with my stepfather. I told my mom. I approached it like, hey, I have a friend who's going through this. She said, point blank, is he doing this to you? And, and I said, yes. For one fraction of a moment, and I keep going back to this, for one moment, I truly felt there was a connection that she truly cared about me. We locked eyes, 
She gave me a big hug, and I truly felt for one moment that she really cared about me. Then she confronted me in front of the stepdad, and then I got the crap beat out of me for trying to steal her husband. And, and I, literally, black and blue all over, my head was a pinball going against the wall all the way to my room. I was locked in there for days. Um, and it was, and then it just got worse. It got worse and worse. I tried telling the sheriff. He said it was my fault, that he's a good church man. He would never do that. It's your fault. It's because you're wearing a tank top and jeans. Okay. Um, I tried telling my sisters. My sisters tried in New York. They tell, they told social services in Idaho, but Idaho wouldn't talk to New York and saying, you know, here's the history. And they said, oh no, she's with her mother. They came into our living room and said, um, are you abusing Rosie? Right in front of me, right in front of my mom and stepdad. They interviewed all of us right there. And of course they said no. And my mom's right behind me with her little control pinch right in my bra line, pinching me like, don't you dare say a thing. And I of course said no, no, no one's doing a thing. So they're not gonna do anything. So of course my didn't couldn't do anything. So my sisters kidnapped me a few days later. They actually physically met me at the bus stop. I didn't know what was happening. They grabbed me a wig and a donut and said, get in the car, we're going to New York. So I put the wig on, ate the donut all the way to the airport. And we went to New York and after 10 days I was there, but the whole time my mother was threatening to take away my sister's kids, to call the police, all of these things, horrible things were about to happen and I knew I had to go back. It was my mom. She had custody and I knew what I was going back to. They had, a, um, they had bought me clothes and I knew if I went back with anything other than what I left with, I was going to get even more beating than I already was. So I went back and I had um, the beating of my life and it got even worse. Beatings were worse. Everything was worse. And that was the darkest period of my life. I didn't think I would recover. Um, so I started abusing drugs and alcohol. Um, pretty bad. And because I really didn't think I would survive or find anything more to hope for. Um, my life preservers was all my church activities, my school activities, cheerleading. I, I loved all of those things. That's actually what kept me, my head above water. When my life sucked so bad at home, I had something to look forward to. I had school, I had the library, I had all those kind people that looked out for me and cared about me. My mom was about to take all that away. She said, no, you're, she knew how to hurt me because all that, she knew it. I cared about that stuff so much. She said, no, you're done. So, so I thought I was done. So I wanted to commit suicide. It was all the friends. The friends gave me encouragement. Friends, friends' parents, they're the ones that gave me hope. They're the ones that actually saw, I was able to see what a healthy home environment looked like. Librarians gave me hope. Without it, I had nothing. If I didn't have school, if I didn't have my friends, I literally had nothing. I didn't have cheerleading, I didn't have my car, I didn't have anything. I literally had nothing. I had my darkness consumed me. Drugs and alcohol were taking the numbness, were numbing me just so I could just survive, just exist. So senior year, I was done. I couldn't, November 2nd, I couldn't see any way out. And two teachers pulled me in. My, the administration, the school said, Rosie can't represent the school anymore. She's doing all these bad behaviors. Meanwhile, my mom had already taken away all my stuff. Now the school administration said, oh, she's doing drugs and alcohol. Look at what a bad kid she is. And uh, that was really hard. It was like a double whammy. So I was like, what do I have to live for? What's the point? 
What's the point of any of this? But once again, teachers, teachers saved me. They pulled me into their office. They chewed me out, said, what are you doing? There was two of them. One was really nice. It was very sweet. The other one chewed me out. <laughs> the one that was chewing me out just kept going for a couple hours, and I was numb. I was done. I was checked out, literally. Literally. I was checking out from school permanently and life. I was done. I didn't need to talk. I didn't owe her anything. Then the other one, all she needed to do was just softly, Rosie, what's going on? That's all I needed. I lost it. Told her everything. Told her everything. Everything. They went out to see my mother, and my mom couldn't pack my stuff fast enough. She, they had said, it sounds like, do you guys need a break? And my mom was like, no, you can take her. I don't want her. So she packed my stuff, and I moved in with the teacher and graduated. It was the first time I was ever on the honor roll. They helped me get to college. I had several teachers that actually helped me do my entrance, and I got to college, went to Idaho State University. So, um, but again, it was, it was the teachers that actually, again, those small, <coughs> kind gestures, those little, small, little things that, those encouraging words. But it was right after high school when my mother and I reconciled, and we were finally like, ah, she finally saw me as like her daughter. She was had love for me, it looked like, it seemed like it. She actually said, I love you, I'm proud of you, because that's really all I wanted. I just said, you've never said I was proud of you. And I felt like confronting her, saying, I just wanted you to say I was proud of you. And then she said I was proud of you. And I felt like, oh, okay, there's my mom. And, and I, it was like I forgave her. And so she said, why don't you just stay here in Cambridge work at Kay's Cafe with me, you can live with me, marry George, who's a farmer, and it'll be great. And you and I will just be mom and daughter and we'll be great. And I was like, okay. <laughs> so I wasn't going to go to college. That's how bad I wanted my mother's love. That is literally how desperate I was. I was about to throw college away. I was about to throw my future away. All of it. That's literally how bad I wanted my mother's love. Well, I didn't go. I didn't stay. I went to college because I talked to my sister Regina and the teacher who helped me. <laughs> and they're like, oh, and they said a lot of expletives, but I won't repeat. <laughs> anyway, they said, no, uh, you're going to college. And I did, which um, I'm beyond grateful. And it was, it was the pivotal moment in my life because I thought as soon as I was away from, from them, okay, I'm free. It was my first semester of college and normal pressures, tests, boyfriends, whatever. And I thought, oh, this is, this is too hard. I, I don't understand what's going on with me because I'm away from my mom. I'm away from my stepdad. But what I realized, even though I was away, physically away from my mother and stepdad, the amount of damage they had done, 17 years of trauma, abuse, had done something so into my core. I had no idea. I had no idea the trauma that occurred inside my body. I just didn't know. I didn't know what I didn't know. But after all that time, I kept focusing on, I don't want to be like Cookie. My mother's name was Cookie. I don't want to be like her. I don't want to be like my mother. I don't want to be like my mother. I don't want to be like my mother. But first thing to find out, power of the mind, what you focus on, you become. Because I kept saying, I don't want to be like her. Started finding abusive men, started abusing drugs, alcohol, doing all the things not to be like Cookie. I turned out just like Cookie. I found myself in a psychiatric hospital on suicide watch. But that sounds like the bottom. But I will tell you, it was the best thing again, another great thing that happened to me. Because it was here that I was diagnosed with bipolar. 
And it wasn't a death sentence. It was a liberation. Because finally, I found I was diagnosed with something that I knew that I could manage. After with medication, finding, finding a combination of medication that works, that worked, I've been on the same medication for 20 years, and it's manageable. And um, there was another thing that I learned in, in to change the focus. Instead of focusing on what you don't want, focus on what you do want. So just like a forensic anthropologist, just like I had to literally identify like I was trying to find a new species. I was trying to read every book about support groups, self-help groups. How do, how do I, how do I live in a world without dysfunction? How do I, how do I become a, a functional adult without abuse? How do I not be an alcoholic? So I joined ACOA, Adult Children of Alcoholics, Al Al-Anon, um, any other 12-step support groups I could go to, anything, counseling, therapy. Every, everything that I could think of, I literally joined just because I could not get enough information because I wanted, I didn't want to be that. I wanted to be, I wanted to inspire, I wanted to aspire to be something different. And, and I just kept, just kept focusing on not letting the darkness consume me. But, um, What I also realized with um, bipolar is the ability to manage it. You need, what I had to do was kind of back up with medication, therapy, coping skills, exercise, sleep, get activating those neurotransmitters. It's, it's a package deal. It's not just taking your medication. And for a long time, because my mother had uh, a lot of medication. I had a love-hate relationship with my medication just because I didn't, again, didn't want to be like my mother. And, but I had to just be an adult about it and realize, you know what, it's, it's more than that. It's my body is lacking something and I need to, this is for me, this is for my health. And these are smart decisions and it's about being proactive with my own health. So that alone was empowering to know that I had control. And not to mention the ability to change my patterns from my past. Even though that was my past and all of that, my mother did that, I didn't have to. My brain was patterned in a way to deal with trauma by, by habit, not because of not because of what I did, it was because of habit, but I can train it. I can retrain my brain to react how I want it to, not out of reaction from emotion or from trauma. It's a process. A lot of times chaos and the underneath, the darkness consumes you. That's why I've needed multiple switch points because of all of those multifacets underneath all of those layers of abandonment, trauma, all of it, because it's been so dissecting all of it. It's been so challenging through the years, even up to three weeks ago. It's, it's just been difficult. Um, and so as manageable as it seems on the surface, there is always chaos underneath. So have you heard that hurt people hurt people? I hurt people because I was hurt. I hurt a lot of people. And when you're hurt, you push a lot of people away. And even when they're trying to do good stuff for you, you sabotage things. You push people away. And that was also part of it. They're my support people. They were part of my support group. They were the ones that were helping me trying to break out of my stuff but I pushed them away because I couldn't, I didn't identify the good they were trying to do for me. They were trying to help me and, and be there for me and I couldn't see it because I didn't know, I just didn't know what I didn't know. And it's kind of like the whole staples thing. Who've heard of 
staples for a house. Buying staples for a house. Have you heard of buying staples for a house? Like, if you have to go to the store and buy staples for a house, do you know what you're getting? Like, milk, bread, eggs, stuff like that? Yeah, no. I was sent to the store to buy staples for our kitchen. I bought three sets of staples. Big staples, small staples, and big, smaller staples. I didn't know what staples were. I didn't know that it meant, like, eggs and bread and... Sometimes you just don't know what you don't know. You just don't. When you're raised in a certain way or you have a history, you learn things the hard way. And it stinks sometimes. Oh, so when I was pregnant, when I was pregnant when I was 25, it was the first time. And I panicked because, again, didn't want to be like my mother. I thought, okay, well, here it comes. This is where it comes. This is, this is when I find out this is like I'm going to be like my mother. And all the anxiety came back. And I read every parenting book I can find because I swore I am going to put all the good stuff in my head because I'm going to vanquish all of that out. I'm going to bury all the bad stuff. So I would actually be one of those crazy stalker ladies at the park, pregnant, luckily. <coughs> but I would literally watch parents with their kids. I would watch the interaction and try to see what a normal mom looks like interacting with kids and I also saw things I didn't want to do which was good but I was able to actually see and see how they interact but at the end of it I realized I just loved my kids like I wanted to be loved at every single age every single age I loved them I scooped them up and now I treat them with as much kindness respect and love unconditional love as I would at my age, at wherever they are. Right now they're 22, 8, 19, and 15. And they're great humans. They're contributors to the health and the world, and they're good, good humans. They're just good people. I kind of like them. <laughs> but, um, and it taught, it taught us all a lot being raised how they did. They didn't know my story. They didn't know my story until about eight years ago, right before I started writing the book. They didn't know anything about it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't let them. They kind of knew a little bit, but I didn't really, I didn't feel the need to tell them because it was, it was then when I started talking to them about it. But even though I realized I was parenting them. I was still a struggling child myself. I was still hurt. I was abandoned. I was still sad, shameful. I was a traumatized child as a parent, even up till about three weeks ago. Um, but that's where support was so beneficial. <clears throat> I realized starting at a young age, all of those small kind gestures, um, they gave me the strength when I didn't have it. I borrowed their strength. When they gave me the encouragement, I borrowed their encouragement. When they gave me courage to say, stand up there and do the speech, I borrowed their courage to do it. It was all of their, it was all of their strength because I was broken. I was so young and I tried not to be, I tried to be unbroken for such a long time. Just borrowing other people's strength helped me gain my own strength. But what I didn't realize was that they were giving me tools for my own toolbox. It was the ability to um, eliminate all of my luggage. All of that stuff was luggage and baggage I was hauling around for years. All of that stuff from the trauma, abandonment, hurt, stuff that my mom gave me, all those gifts, and all of it, any, regardless, all the stuff that I was given and experienced all that time was all in that baggage. But for me, I couldn't just store it. I couldn't just put it in a storage shelf, couldn't put it in a box, couldn't put it somewhere and just hide it. I'm one who 
goes through everything. Um, I have to go through everything. So I had to open up each item. And for me, I was able to look at it like clothing items. So I had to take out each shirt. And can I use this? What can I learn from this shirt? Is this something that's useful for me? No, get rid of it. Or yes, this is useful. Or, or I can learn something from it. I take a button off it and I put it in my toolbox. And then I take that with me. But then I'm eliminating all the baggage, but I'm building a toolbox with me. But that, with all the kind adults, the guidance, encouragement, constructive criticism, sometimes I didn't want to hear it, but that's part of the toolbox. Those are all of those guidance and the support system, those people that taught me how to, how to be a better human, how to be a good human, the things that a parent's supposed to teach you. All these adults, the support systems, that teacher, who's very much still in my life right now. She's my, she's my mom for all intents and purposes right now. Um, but gratitude lists, that's something I use all the time. I started writing them in high school when I was a senior in high school and I still write them today because it keeps me things in perspective. Um, grateful for what I have now. Um, the luggage, I use that metaphorically all the time because I'm grateful I don't haul that baggage around. It's such a relief. And it, those gratitude lists are so, um, it keeps life in perspective because it keeps all of those big things, the petty things that I think, oh, you know, whatever. I was homeless. I have a roof over my head. And so sometimes I'm just beyond grateful. I have a roof over my head. I have food in my fridge. I have clothes to wear and I have a bed to sleep in. Those are my top, those are my top things that, you know what? And I have a giant smile on my face and I'm grateful. That, that's when I have my foundation and I'm grateful. I have to just remind myself, yes, I have no money in the bank, but I am grateful. Because you know what? Really, we do. We really do. It provides hope. It provides hope. <laughs> so, um, so I know my medication is necessity, therapy for maintenance, exercise and sleep for sanity, coping skills and support is what I need most. Gratitude lists is just part of the deal because I just, I need that. That's just part of it. Um, each decision was initially made due to some broken part of myself. Um, I was trying to figure out where things went wrong, but I, I went along as if I knew, but I had those anchors to always come back to. It was my support system. My friends, my therapy, prayer, my medication, reading, working out, journaling, of course, gratitude lists. When you think you're about to fall, you want someone there to catch you. You have to be willing to ask for help. And that's what I had to do. I had to learn that along the way. I had to be vulnerable and willing to ask for help. I'll always have my past as a foundation to learn from, but I realize it's not what defines me or where I'll end up. But it's a pivotal point in my life because that's the journey, right? It's not the destination. That's what life's about. Maybe I've realized that's what the switch point is, is the timing of my knowledge shift. College did that for me. College is where I think I made my ultimate switch. I was able to, there was such a moment right before college, I almost didn't go. In college, I went to the psychiatric hospital my mother was trying not to let me continue college. There were so many times in college, she didn't want me to stay in college. She was trying to get me out, trying to pull me out of college. But I stayed. It took me six years. After six years, I finally got two degrees, but I made it. And, and I stayed the course. They had free counseling for students. 
they had volunteer programs, they had outreach, they had special events, of course they had cheerleading. <laughs> uh, it, was, it was amazing, it really was. But the free resources and the kind, again, those kind gestures, any student would, it was a perfect place for me to be, to have such a, a great support system. Um, and, and they encouraged me to be a better person. And that really was my pivotal point that changed the trajectory of my life. Really could have gone in so many different directions, but college changed that for me. But with every person you meet, your words have power. And really, your words are your superpower. Every person you, you meet, you have a chance to make an impact in their life. Your words can give them hope. Your words can also spew venom like my mother's did. But your words can actually make a difference in people's lives. And they do. They do every day. You change people's lives every single day. So... People may never forget the things that hurt them, but they'll always remember that you gave them hope. It ended with me, my siblings and I. We broke the cycle of abuse, poverty, and homelessness. All five of us. We have 13 kids among all of us with four of the next generation that have not been affected by abuse, homelessness, or poverty. If there was an organization like Switchpoint when we were kids, I would have hoped my mother would have utilized the resources and really would have been able to pull herself out of it because really there's enough resources to pull yourself out of situations like that. And Switchpoint is encompassing many of the layers I've just discussed that really embraces all of these. So it's a beautiful thing what Switchpoint has. It really is, because it encompasses so many of the things that people face. <laughs>